Hello everybody and welcome to this video where I'm going to be doing a tag. I'm it. I got two tags to do. I'm going to try to do them both today. I got tagged last night by Gareth over at Book Songs and Other Magic. Um, it's this, uh, oh man, what was the actual tag called? The song tag. How did I, how did I not just know that? Okay, so here it is. Name a song that always makes you happy. The first song that came to my head when I heard that was um, Pass the Duchy by Musical Youth. Always makes me happy. Like, I could be in any mood in the world and that song's great. Like, ska usually makes me happy. And reggae, it's hard for it to not make me happy. Well, there's a lot of cramp songs that make me happy when I listen to them. Like, I could put on really anything off of the first two Cramps albums and then um, off of Stay Sick and that could put a smile on these lips. So the next question, name a song that's a great fit for when you're in a pensive mood. It depends, really, because uh, I could, like, I'm usually in pensive moods, but those moods are predicated on other you know what I'm saying? So, like, if I'm deep in thought because I'm trying to figure out business stuff, that's something different than if I'm deep in thought because I'm writing. And then when I get to that, it's like, am I deep in thought because I'm writing uh, a novel or a poem or a screenplay or, you know, like just like it depends on what that is. And considering that most of the time I I feel like I'm deep in thought, like I feel like I'm contemplating i don't know i feel like i'm in that mood more than any other like right now i'm very pensive thinking about this so what would i want to listen to um i would guess either like the smiths or mazzy star slash hope sandoval i'll go through phases where i listen to all the smiths albums and then all the songs that were released on other stuff that weren't on the albums and I'll just like put that on a loop. And I'll usually put um, Morrissey's Bone of Drag and Viva Hate on there too. Because I love those two albums. And yes, like you end up getting like Suede Head a couple times. You know, what are you going to do? Those are just really good, like low in the background thinking kind of things. I used to, and I guess I still kind of do, but I. Like, and I've talked about this before, and somebody told me this was called something, and I don't remember. But, um, like, I call this, like, blue music because when I listen to that music, I see the color blue, I feel the color blue, like, I, I hear the color blue, you know, like a light, cool blue and then sometimes it can get deeper and deeper and darker but it's always blue you know so there's a lot of stuff that kind of falls into that a lot of times when I'm just thinking I'll put on the blue music and so yes I'll have like the Smiths and Mazzy Star and all that other will have like um, the first two or three like Tom Waits albums like Closing Time um, Heart of Saturday Night. Um, what's another one? Uh, Small Change. I all have that in there. And then I could have like, um, oh, Chris Isaac's Forever Blue. God, it's in the title. Chris Isaac's Forever Blue is a banger. Like that whole album, really good. And then like Jillian Welch um, or Gillian Welch, however you say it. Um, Time the Revelator, that album's a banger. I could have that in there. And then if I'm going to go that far with her and um, Dave Rawlings, I'll have a bunch of her stuff and his stuff in there too. But like that's kind of like the vibe when I get like that. But also like all the Mazzy Star catalog, um, the first Hope Sandoval album, and... Um, like any singles, because I used to collect her singles too. 
and the b-sides on them and if you are not familiar i used to have i used to collect um demo tapes from bands like cassette tapes kind of flip them on ebay and stuff and i used to have like a bunch of pearl jam stuff like because there were always bootlegs of like their shows on cassette that you could get before they started putting out all their shows on CD anyway. But anyway, whatever. But if you ever come across Opal, I don't know if you could find Opal on um, Spotify or anything like that. I haven't even checked. I should look. But Opal was Mazzy Star before it was Mazzy Star. There's some bangers on there too. So, but yeah. So that's that's my blue pensive music god that was a long ass name a song that changed your taste in music this is kind of heavy because i feel like my taste in music has always changed i remember motley Crue's kickstart my heart was like the first oh my god like i was like in sixth grade and i saw the video for it and i was like i want to be nikki six and that, like, really got me, you know? Just, like, that opening guitar, like, sounding like a motorcycle revving, you know? Oh, it's so good. And then that's another thing, too, because, like, I grew up um, about 20 minutes to a half hour from Hollywood. And when that video opens up, like, it's them in a limo pulling up, driving down Sunset Boulevard, going to the Whiskey. And I guess, like, most of the concert was shot in the Whiskey, or most of the video was shot in the whiskey. And I played at the whiskey. But it, it it's weird. Like, I don't, like, correlate it like that. But it, it must be weird for people who haven't lived here. Because, like, when I lived a half hour from Hollywood, I felt like Hollywood was so far away. I was just like, oh, man. Because, like, in the 80s, and, like, especially the late 80s, like, the Sunset Strip music scene... You know, like Motley Crue, Guns N' Roses. I mean, those were the the big hitters there. But you had a ton of glam. And I, I don't even want to call them glam because, like, I feel like glam is way more, um, like, 70s, like, New York Dolls and, um, like, Bowie and Slade and the Sweet and Mott the... Or, like, I feel like that's more glam. And what, back in the day, like, we called them glam, like Poison and Motley Crue and all this. But I feel like the hair metal term it just suits it so much better. Because, like, I don't know. Like, because there was, there's a distinct difference. But then, when Smells Like Teen Spirit dropped, that changed everything for me. And what's weird is I can't remember what came out first. Because I remember... I mean, I think Alice in Chains was first, so Man in the Box, and that was, like, a big deal, but I still felt like Alice in Chains was still, like, a hair metal band, you know? And, I mean, it took Jerry Cantrell a bit to, like, pull away from that. But when you had Lane Staley looking like um, he just was pulled out of the cow, you know? Like, it's hard to look at him and then look at Brett Michaels, you know, or Sebastian Bach. He had an amazing voice. But anyway, and then I can't remember if Outshine by Soundgarden came out or Alive by Pearl Jam or Smells Like Teen Spirit. Smells Like Teen Spirit probably came out before the... the, But here's the thing about Soundgarden. Soundgarden was another band that was teetering on coming out of, like, metal. Coming out of, like... um, So they were, like, still kind of a little bit the same, but when Nirvana broke, dude, and Pearl Jam too, but when Nirvana broke, when Nirvana broke, I was just like, oh my god. And, like, again, it's a music video shot in a gym at any school USA. It looked like the school I was at. Um, And these guys dressed like I did like I wasn't having to like go oh man I can't wait till the day I can buy leather pants and light them on fire and wear a fishnet shirt they dress normal they had their hair in that 
awkward. I'm trying to grow it out so I could look as cool as these dudes, but I'm not quite there yet because I just got into music over the last couple of years. And you know that's not true because like on the Bleach album, Kurt Cobain's hair was like down to whatever, but whatever. The presentation of Nirvana was huge. And I don't know if you can... Because I feel like there was a period over the last 30 years where people tried to kind of minimize what Nirvana did and then all of a sudden it was like, oh, but no, they were the biggest thing ever. But, like, you know, speaking, you know, like the... And it's like, you cannot... Like, I watched Dial MTV with Adam Curry every day when I got home from school. I voted every day, okay? Not on my phone. I would go next door to the kid when his parents were at home and I would run up their phone bill. But anyway, you had Sebastian Bach with Skid Row doing I Remember You. Wonderful song. And that was number one for months. And then MC Hammer's You Can't Touch This happened and started edging like Skid Row away. Okay? And then Smells Like Teen Spirit happened. And it was like they were at like number eight, number four, number one. And then everything else died. Everything else died. Adam Curry had to cut his hair or get a new job because he looked like, I don't know, Marky Post from Night Court. Um, but whatever. So that was pretty big. But around the same time, because I really like Pearl Jam because even when I was in seventh grade or whatever, I had a deeper voice. And so, like, I always felt like I wasn't going to make it in, like, the metal scene, like, with all the hair bands. Like, I'm like, I can't do that. So when Pearl Jam came out, and, like, I would listen to The Cult and stuff, you know, Sweet Soul Sister, the whole thing. And I'm like, okay, I could kind of deal with that. The Doors, I could deal with that, you know. But when Pearl Jam came out, I was like, oh, I could do that. I can do that. And then Stone Tumble Pilots came out, and that was kind of like a middle ground. And I'm like, I could do that. But one of these nights, it was like in the middle of the night, and the album probably already been out for like a year or two. But I saw the video for um, Social Distortion's Ball and Chain. And I was like, oh, sh that guy's cool as fuck. He's got fucking tattoos. He's playing a big ass guitar. And this song is just like a rockin', like old rock and roll sounding song. Because like I grew up in Southern California listening to K Earth 101, solid gold oldies, man. Like, doo-wop and rock hits. Like, it, it's like when I saw Mike Ness, how he was dressed, the sound. Because I had the Stray Cats, you know? I, they, they were big when I was a little kid, you know? Like, and he was like, if the Stray Cats were cool. If the Stray Cats, like, weren't going on tour with the Fun Boy 3, you know what I'm saying? Like, they looked cool. And then I found out that they were from where I lived. And then, like... It's so weird because, like, as high school happened, all these bands came out. And a lot of them went to my high school. Like, um, Lit. I don't know if you remember Lit. They went to my high school. Um, and they used to be called Razzle. And they were a hair metal band. And I had, I had Razzle posters up on my... Not posters, but flyers. They used to put flyers up on my wall. Adrian from No Doubt went to my school. Um, he was actually in my sister's class. And... Um, the rest of the No Doubt folks went to Loera, where my nephew went to school, but uh, that's in Anaheim, but no, no big deal. But like um, The Offspring, uh, Real Big Fish, The Aquabats, uh, Save Ferris. I mean, there, there were so many bands that ended up coming out from where I was at. But anyway, so when I found out the Social Distortion was local, I'm like, oh my God, they're not a Hollywood band. What the f Like you could... you. And again, I'm a kid. I don't realize this. I'm like, you can be a, a, a popular band and not live in Hollywood and not play on the Sunset Strip all the time? Like, I, I'm still not knowing anything because, like, obviously all these Seattle bands just came out. But again, that was Seattle was now the new thing, you know? So anyway, so Social Distortion changed my life right there, okay? But I got that tape. And on that tape is a cover song of Ring of Fire, the Johnny Cash song. 
And then I started listening to Johnny Cash. And I was like, holy sh... And in listening to Johnny Cash, like, especially, like, I mean, I was listening to, more likely than not at that point, his um, Columbia recordings. Like, um, stuff from, like, before 1983. And I was just like, oh, yeah, this is cool. This guy's got an amazing voice. He's a badass. Singing about a boy named Sue and Folsom Prison Blues, like, San Quentin. Like, Jesus Christ, this guy's really fit around or whatever. I don't know what I'm doing, you know? Um, but then, I think it was in 1994. Wow, this story is getting really long. In 1994, American Recordings came out. The album he did with Rick Rubin. That, like, put him back on the map after the 80s and overproduction destroyed him. Okay? American Recordings was the album that really taught me how to play guitar, taught me how to feel confident enough in my ability with just my voice and my guitar, and how raw and how emotional that can be. Because the other thing you have to understand is acoustic music that was still edgy, before this, the only thing you really had was MTV Unplugged or The Violent Femmes. And The Violent Femmes weren't that edgy. You know what I'm saying? And on MTV Unplugged, you had big acts doing stuff. So you had, you know, Alice in Chains and Soundgarden. Or no, I don't know if Soundgarden did it, but Stone Temple Pilots, obviously Nirvana. And you even had, like, bigger, older acts come in and do it and the whole thing. But it was still a big production. It wasn't raw. And that feeling that I got listening to American recordings, and which is why Unchained broke my heart, because they went from, I think that's the album he did with the Heartbreakers, Tom Petty's band. That was the follow-up album. But, like, American recordings won Grammys. Like, it put him on the map. It, like, solidified, if, in case no one knew that Rick Rubin was a genius, it solidified him. You know, and I think that was around the time too. I could be wrong about this, but I think um, Ruben dropped Deaf American, like dropped the Deaf part of it around this time, maybe a little bit before. Because I think the first Danzig album was 88, and that still said Deaf American, but Lucifage, I think, was 90. And I don't know if that said Deaf American yet. It doesn't matter. Um, but uh, that taught me how to play guitar, like, with, like, just my fingers. It, like, there were little things that happened throughout my life, like playing with my family's bluegrass band in Florida for a summer when I was, like, 14. Taught me how to play bass. You know, like, even though I knew how to play bass for a couple of years before that, that taught me how to play bass. Like, when I was there, I was like, oh you know what I'm saying and like I knew how to play guitar before this I've been in bands before this but when I heard that album and then started listening to like Carter Family um, Willie Nelson's Redheaded Stranger um, just like tons of then I was like oh this is how you play guitar like I don't know if this makes any sense and that's not even the the end of it like like when I first heard Black Flag that changed my life um, I think it was Wasted. I was like, the song was like fast and angry and and it was over in 47 seconds. And I was like, I want to do that. Like, that was like a huge thing. That made me look at Nirvana and go, what are they doing? Like, these guys are better and did it first. You know what I'm saying? Um, so there's all sorts of stuff like that. Name a recent song that you that you've just discovered and loved. Um, there's some reggaeton stuff that I really like, but I don't know the names of anything. It just like comes on if I have like, um, like I'll hit play on like reggaeton 2022 or whatever, and I'll just hear certain songs. And like I always looked, I'm like, oh, I should remember who. The, and I'm like, I'm not gonna be. But honestly, like, I think the newest thing that I've been into is Lizzo. Lizzo is amazing. 
and it's like albums are amazing. Like it's not like you just heard that song, where it's like. Um, in a minute, in a minute, oh, it's about damn time. Jesus Christ, that took me forever. Um, like that's the first song I heard, and I was like, "Oh, damn! Ow, ow!" You know what I'm saying? And then um, I listened to that whole album and the album before it, and I was just like, "Good God!" It's like there there've not been many um, like pop stars that have done that to me, but like Lady Gaga did that to me, Lord's first album did that to me, Adele's Twenty One album did that to me, and um, those two Lizzo albums. Damn, you know what I'm saying? All right. Um, next, name three bands or artists that you love. Oh, there's so many more than three. This is oh, this is difficult. Okay, I'll try to say stuff that I haven't said yet. So the Ramones. Um, love the Ramones. I don't know how anyone who listens to, like, music before 1970 or anything popular since cannot love the Ramones. Like, they are just, like, probably the best simple band there is don't want to just say a bunch of punk bands but like the misfits love the misfits and i loved everything the misfits have done and parts that they've done like i never got into christ the conqueror really but um like when glenn left the misfits and then did sam hain love sam hain and then obviously the first four danzig albums um are arguably classics that should be like listened to by every single person for the rest of eternity after that not so much um but even the misfit stuff when michael graves came in like american psycho and famous monsters and cuts from the crypt those are great um oh i was gonna say like when um the misfits had jerry only singing then um it was still cool and i like it but it's kind of more of like a cover band now than anything that it used to be. And I don't mean that to be disparaging towards the Misfits or Jerry Only or anything like that. It just is. Love Black Flag. But uh, I haven't said any like real two-tone stuff, so I'll say the first two specials albums. So the specials. Uh, there's, I mean, whatever. You know what I'm saying. Um, what instrument would you like to be able to play? Oh, I was just talking about this a while ago, the piano. Like, I want to do piano bars. I would love to be able to do that. I just don't think I will ever have the patience to be able to learn something like that again. Um, but, yeah, I would love that. Um, name a fiction book with music at the center of the narrative. I don't know who is going to be doing this, but, like, High Fidelity, I don't know how you can not talk about that it's amazing even though it's kind of focused on like records and collecting records and like that and everything's about something that comes through that um but like get in the van by henry rollins is great john doe did an, but a book uh, he was in the band x still in the band x i read keith morris's book my damage and that's okay but i just read a book called spray paint the walls which was like a history of black flag there was kind of a lot wrong in it like just factually inaccurate stuff that doesn't seem like it would be hard to figure out so i just like that annoys me oh we were talking about fiction books yeah then i'll just say high fidelity um i can't think of anything else off the top of my head right now um but High Fidelity is a great book, and I can't remember the dude's name that wrote it, but I remember after I read that book like four times in a row, I uh, got his next book, The Good Something, Good Boy, or Good Son, or I don't know, and it was garbage. So, Gareth, thanks for the great tag, and I'm sorry that this was so long. <laughs> so I'm supposed to tag people. Hey, if you like music do this tag okay it's a great tag all right so keep buying my books it's way over there type hard everybody listen hard and i will talk to you all later
I just want to give a quick thanks to those people who make these videos possible. Anarchy Crew and my followers on Patreon. I appreciate the hell out of you guys and thank you so much for keeping me going to keep this content possible. You guys are awesome. And if you'd like to join the crew or the Anarchy Crew, just hit the join button beneath this video. And if you'd like to become a member of my Patreon, you can run over to the link down below to do that as well. Thank you.